Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. This week, writer Javier Zamora describes the treacherous 3,000-mile journey he made from El Salvador to the U.S. when he was just nine years old. Led by coyotes, he and a group of strangers made three perilous attempts to cross the border. Javier's parents, who had earlier migrated to California to escape violence at home, had no idea for weeks if their only child was still alive. In his debut poetry collection, Unaccompanied, and now in his best-selling memoir, Solito, Javier Zamora explains that he hopes to personalize the immigration story. Javier Zamora, what is the story that you tell in your new book, Solito? Uh, my memoir, Solito, is about growing up in El Salvador after the Civil War that lasted from 1980 to 1992. My dad flees in 1991. My mom leaves in 1995. And then I grew up with my grandparents from the ages of five until nine. And the book is told by my nine-year-old self and it begins weeks before April 6, 1999, which is the date in which I leave with the coyote that helped my mom get here in 1995. And it, the trip is supposed to last two weeks, similarly to how long my mom's trip lasted. And it turns out into a nine week journey in which the coyote leaves myself and a group of six individuals and we become this pseudo family. I get closer to a 19 year old man by the name of Chino, a 28 year old mom named Patricia and a 12 year old daughter named Carla. And then it is us who help each other and then survive and cross through the Sonoran desert to eventually make it to the US. That long trip, how many times did it actually take you to attempt to cross the border before you were successful? The U.S.-Mexico border takes us three times. And just to emphasize what a little guy you were when you started out on this journey, you described that you didn't even know how to tie your shoes and you were afraid of big people's toilets. So I guess the <laughs> question that I had and most people would have reading your memoir is, what gave your parents the confidence that a little guy like you could make this journey alone? Well, you know, that is the absurd and equation that my parents had to balance. And, you know, we tried, they, we tried to get a visa, a U.S. visa, they denied me. And then they tried to bring me uh, via air with fake documents that didn't work. And what gave them the confidence essentially was that they were using hiring the exact same person to help my mom get here. And she made it here relatively safe, if I can use that word to describe anybody's immigration trip. Uh, and the man, Don Dago, who was my coyote, was with her every single step of the way, literally. And they expected him to do the same for me. And of course, he for some reason that we still don't know, he leaves the group, because uh, I wasn't the only one paying him, uh, a group of adults and two children, and he leaves us stranded right before we board a boat to get from Guatemala to Mexico. And then we don't ever see him again. So, it's... so I guess that, that that is the reason why they, they agreed and factored all the factors in. They had and allowed me confidence in Don, in Don Diego, which was misplaced mm -hmm. confidence in the end. Mm -hmm. So it's been 23 years since you made this tremendous journey. Why did you decide to write this book now? Uh, you know, this is a journey that was very difficult for me to remember. The details were always there. The metaphor that I like to use is that you know, trauma happens in HD, full surround sound. And whenever I would see a headline or watch a movie that talked about immigration, I was put back into that surround sound and the HD movie. But when I wasn't triggered, I hid that away. And essentially, you got to a point um, in 2019 when I was researching the 2017 to 2018 
child immigrant crisis or the crisis at the border in which I said, all these other people are talking for these children. All these politicians are talking about these children. I am one of those children, not in 2017, but in, in 1999. It is time that I stop being so afraid of facing my nine-year-old self. And I began to write. And from then on, it has helped me shift my point of view of not only looking at this nine-year-old kid, meaning me as this weak, little, helpless child, but the writing of this memoir has helped me look at him as a superhero and as a survivor that managed to live and survive what at times seems the unsurvivable. What was it like for your parents reading your book? Oh, <laughs> um, like I say at the end, this is a story that we talked about immediately after it occurred and they cried. And I think they have a lot of guilt for having put me through that, which again, they didn't expect. And we've only talked about it in full three times. And my dad read the book, he finished it. He helps me with the Spanish translation and he cried and he apologized. My mom has not read past chapter one and I think it's difficult for her to read and relive their own trauma because I'm describing my trauma over the nine weeks. But for seven weeks, my parents did not know where their one and only kid was and they couldn't do anything about it. And that has caused their own trauma. And I'm not a parent and I can't imagine what it was like for them. That gives the title of the book, Solito, uh, uh, multiple levels of meaning, doesn't it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You were alone, yes. they were alone, you took the journey alone, and, and you were lonely as you took it. So, so many different levels of interpretation of the word. And after the fact, too, you know, I get here in 1999, and it wasn't until I started writing at the age of 18 that I feel like I have to carry this trauma by myself. And yeah, I feel alone, I feel like there aren't other children like me, and of course that's not the truth. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the structure and process of the book. You uh, are a professional writer, in fact, a poet. And an earlier treatment of this topic area was a book of poetry. Uh, so w it's clear that you bring your poet's lyricism to the text of this book. And I, I, I picked out one short paragraph so people could get a sense of what your writing style was like. Would you be able to read it for us? Of course. Uh -huh. This is in, takes place during one of the attempts. And Alcadejo is a mythical uh, figure in Salvadoran folklore. And he's supposed to protect every, everybody has one. And this is like a dog-like figure with goat hooves that protects you. And, uh, I'm ready. Avoiding cactuses is boring. I want barbed wire, thin, metallic, pointy. The smell of dust, thicker when our faces are in the dirt. Dirt in our noses, in our mouths. None of us got hurt. In Acapulco, when Coyote told us we might go through the desert, I never pictured this. Bushes, trees, cactuses, bunnies, mice, bats, fences, mountains in the distance. I thought it was going to be sand and sand only, like Aladdin. The fences are cool. I feel like I'm back home chasing iguanas. I practice. It's the most exciting thing we've done all trip. It's a game. Who can make it through the most fences without getting stuck? My arms have markings of the rocks from when I crawled under. Imprints. It's worth it. My hands are scratched and I can feel a thorn in my left palm, but that's okay. We keep walking, the fences can't stop us. We get to another one and we're masters. Chele and Marcelo help each other. Mario helps Patricia and Carla. Chino helps me. None of us get stuck, other people do. So we make up a few positions in the line. Cadejo protects us. 
I look for his eyes, but only find trash or a rock or someone's water bottle. I'm so awake. It's almost 11. The latest I've stayed up since the boats and I'm not tired at all. So one question you'd have as a reader is how you were able to recover such detailed memories. Uh, multi-layered answer. Uh, one is that trauma happens, like I just mentioned, in this ultra sensory, high definition realm that you never forget, but you try to run away from it and you triple lock it in a drawer in your brain. And when you're triggered, you're playing, you're replaying that movie and you're back there. I can still taste the dust that I just read about. So there's one. The trick is accessing that video on your own terms. And this is where, for me, um, therapy has really helped. And having a therapist who is a specialist in child immigrants and is an immigrant herself from the Dominican Republic really allowed me to go there. And at the same time, my wife is a Reiki practitioner and we would have Reiki sessions in which I was thrown back into an uh, immigration detention cell or in the desert as I'm running away from helicopters. And we moved to Tucson in the, pro in the process of writing this book. And I had to expose myself to the similar landscape, to the elements that I lived through when I was nine years old. And that reminded me and put me back into that sphere of the video and the Blu-ray DVD. You talked about your parents' emotional reaction. I just was reading a story before I came down to the studio in the New York Times about your experience in recording the audiobook version of Solito. Why was it so emotional for you? Oh, um, the writing of it, I choked up at certain parts, almost the expected parts, the difficult aspects of like running away from the helicopter or being in a detention cell. The editing of it, I got to know Chino and Patricia, and it's almost, in hindsight, expected that they would move me to tears. In the reading of it, when I'm not, I wasn't looking at the book through an editor's lens or, or a writer's lens, but just absorbing the story. There were certain passages that I hadn't realized it still affect me today. For example, when I talk about this teenager who dropped out of school in order to work and drive his BC taxi, which is a bicycle taxi cab in a border town in Guatemala, and just him acknowledging that he doesn't have to go to school because he can make money and he's been doing this since he was a 12 year old, that made me cry because here I am being a writer who has learned and listened to his lesson but I have the privilege to just be a writer. And another passage was when we were hungry and we had just attempted our second try at the border and we go to the shelter and nuns drop hot food on a paper plate. And I just remember how good that, ta that plate tasted and it really broke me down. So. It, it was it's a completely different process to read your own book out loud and my wife was there and her brother was there and i don't think i would have allowed myself to cry in the studio if it was strangers around me but it was family who was there so before we get into more details of book uh, of course publishing this book at this point puts you right in the middle of this ongoing contentious debate this country is having about the southern border, illegal immigration, and border security. What perspective does your book bring to all of that? Well, I don't like that I word. I would call it um, paperless migration or undocumented migration. Um, and what I hope this book does is that it really sheds a light into the humanity and empathy and superhuman powers that immigrants are forced to embody and to enact. 
and we're not pawns and we're not only our trauma we are more than that we are also our joy even in the darkest moments of our lives we have the capability of laughing of joking of enjoying a hot plate of food and being really joyful about it and i hope that this book doesn't flatten us like most of the politicians and news outlets do to immigrants because they just treat us as these bouncing boards of trauma when we are more than we are 3d full-bodied human beings capable of everything and what the word that doesn't really get used uh, around immigration is survival we are survivors and what would happen if we treat every single one of these individuals as survivors i think the general american public would have more empathy and we could really begin to have a real conversation and provide real solutions to this problem Okay, let's spend a bit more time on your actual details of your story. Your village in El Salvador, age of nine, you wrote of it that there was one way in and one way out. Uh, how small was it? Who was raising you after your parents left? Uh, at the time, it was a very small town, and there was one asphalted road and one dirt road. And I want to say the town couldn't have been bigger than a thousand people. And it's stuck in the middle of a mangrove forest. And it's the town, the road that leads to the one pier in the entirety of the mangrove bay or mangrove forest estuary, I don't know what to call it. And when my mom left, I was left at the care of my grandma, my grandpa, and my aunt becomes this pseudo mom who I trust and I get really close to. But in reality, she's only eight to nine years older than me. So she must have been like 18, 19. So she was like an older sister. And I spent four beautiful years in perhaps the most peaceful time in Salvadoran history. But it is during this peaceful time that people begin to get murdered in my hometown and the town begins to grow and it is the, those outside factors and the violence are also the reasons for why my parents can't wait anymore. It's like they could foresee what eventually does end up happening in my country, which is this pandemic of crime and gangs taking over and corruption at the political level. Do you still have family living there now? Yes. Um, Part of the research of this book was obtaining a green card and finally after 19 years being able to return to my country and return to the exact same room uh, that I grew up in that sadly hasn't changed much. We did change the roof. It is no longer a terracotta roof, but um, a more modern uh, roof. The house is still there. My grandma and my grandpa is still there. My cousin Julia who when I left was five years old, uh, still there, but everybody else has left. My mom can't return. My aunts have both left and can't return. And I'm the only member of my family who can do the back and forth. And that's also has been very difficult at, for me at, to navigate. At the time that your mother left, why did she or was she not able to take you with her? Because she came here without papers. Um, and in her calculation, I think like most immigrants, they believe that we're, she believed that she was gonna leave for a few years and that the situation in my country was gonna improve. And by the time that I'm seven and eight, it looks like the situation is not improving. Um, like I described in the book, one of her friends who has tattoos gets shot right in front, a few feet away from the room in which I, I sleep so I'm woken up as a nine-year-old because this man gets shot and I think that is what convinced her there's no way that I'm leaving my son or that I myself I'm returning or that my husband is returning to this country 
that we thought was going to finally be in peace, but it looks like it's not. So you were a student at a Catholic school and you were a good student and a great at grammar even at that early age. But you write about as you prepared to leave for your trip that it was important not to tip off the nuns of what was impending. Why not? What were you and your family concerned about? You know, there is there are rumors in small towns. Um, like I believe it's still happening now. Everybody knows a coyote or knows somebody that is thinking about, is preparing to, or has just left to come to the United States. And part of that uh, rumor mill was that nuns, Jesuit nuns, were stopping children from leaving, which I have looked into it and I have not found any sort of proof. So I think it's just a made up rumor that trickled down to to my nine-year-old self. And so I was very afraid about not telling anybody. And my grandparents uh, believed this too. It might have been a trick that they used. Uh, I've asked them. Um, they, they, they sincerely thought that nuns were doing this to this day. Um, but yeah, we just didn't trust them that they were going to allow me to leave because I was their valedictorian. You know, I, I won this, I almost won this national spelling bee that put my Catholic school on the national conversation in the national map and I shook the president's hand. And so I was, I was a very good student and we were afraid that because I was a very good student that they were gonna tell on me. So you were carrying this secret with you for at least a full year before because every time you spoke to your parents, they kept referencing your upcoming trip, the trip we read about so often, the trip that you were, uh, getting yourself mentally prepared for and emotionally prepared for. Uh, I, I, I guess as I was struck by the ceremony that you had when it was time to leave with your schoolmates uh, because you couldn't tip them off and yet you convey through it a real sense of the finality of the moment. Would you tell me about it? Yeah, and talking to my therapist, you know, those two things are, are skills that I learned have stuck with me. One, wanting to be a good student because I've always wanted to be loved and taken care of. And the other is learning to be such a good liar from such a small age because I had to. And the days before, I never invited my my best friends to play with. I had like this echelon or like um, levels of toys. My best toys, nobody touched. And they still, I didn't allow them to this last day that I hung out with them. But the second level, I finally revealed and brought my second best toys because my mom worked at a Toys R Us in the United States. So I had, for example, the Jurassic Park walking T-Rex that you can like remote control. I had remote control cars, which in a small coastal town, that was, oh my God, the same toy that I'm seeing when the cartoons are playing is are right here. And so they come over and we have our last play date and I still can't tell them. I can't tell them that I'm leaving because there's this fear that somebody is going to tell somebody that's going to tell the Salvadoran police or the Guatemalan police, meaning immigration, and they're not going to allow me to cross into Guatemala. So tell me about, about the way that your grandparents, in particular grandfather, prepared you for the journey. Um, for lack of a better term, my grandpa was an alcoholic and he drank up until my mom left. So he stopped drinking when I turned five. But from the ages of three to five, I remember a lot of his, you know, struggles with alcohol. And so I was afraid. I was never close to him. Who I was close to and closest to were my grandma and my aunt. And they try to prepare me for this trip, telling me that, you know, um, I had issues uh, being potty trained, which is not unusual for children who have been left by their mothers. It's not that I couldn't, it's like a, there was a mental block that didn't allow me because it was my mom who was potty training me at the same time that she left. So I refused to use a toilet. And so they try to like tell me, you know, if you're on this trip, you're gonna have to use a toilet. So there's that, another one, um, was 
that I needed to do my dishes, fold my own clothes, and try my best to not bother the adults around me, which in hindsight ended up paying off because I wasn't a, a nuisance for the adults around me. Or I tried my best not to get in the way of the adults. Almost it's respect, but it turned out to be a survival tactic. And then once I leave them and I'm stuck with my grandpa, he used the, his best skills in the military to help me tell time. And I still do this to this day. If you stick your hand out like this, and this is the horizon, and that's where the sun is, you have an hour left of sunlight. And if the sun is higher up, you can do this, and you have two hours left. And if it's right there, you have 45, 30, 15. And he learned that in the military, and he taught me this in the two weeks that we spent together in Guatemala, and we roomed together, and I end up beginning to trust my grandpa for the very first time in my life and to have these beautiful, wonderful conversations that I still remember and cherish to this day in which he tells me about his life before grandma and his life in the military and all the things and all the places that he's uh, been to or hasn't been to. And it was the first time that he himself leaves El Salvador to explore Guatemala. And I can see my grandpa in a different light and we get close for two weeks, and then it's very hard for me to say goodbye to him when he has to return to El Salvador, and we have to go to a coastal town to get on these boats. Yeah, your grandfather also taught you a lot of things that you had to memorize. Your parents' telephone number, the names of the towns you were expected, and also a lot of Mexican heritage touch points. You were going to be assuming a Mexican identity as you crossed the U.S. border. Why was that important? Um, you know, there's this figure at the U.S.-Mexico border of the people or the nationalities that were tra most traveling to the United States in the 90s. And I want to say on paper, the statistics say that it was 95% Mexican. And I would kindly uh, assume that that is not fact because a lot of Central Americans or people from other countries were lying in order to not be deported all the way back to their home countries. Because if you say you're Mexican, you just get deported to Mexico and then you can try again. And that is part of this culture of learning or expecting what the cops or the Mexican police or Mexican immigration will ask you in order to prove Mexicanness. And those questions are as simple as you say you're from Guadalajara. Okay, tell me the three soccer teams that are based in Guadalajara. Or sing the Mexican chorus, the anthem. Only the chorus. Okay, you got the chorus? Tell me the first strophe. And things like that. And also, okay, who's our president right now? Who has, in your opinion, who have been the two best presidents? And these are things that as a nine year old, I had to memorize in case that the cops were going to ask me and were not going to believe that the people that I was with were my parents. Uh, and that parental figure changed when Don Dago, our coyote, was still around. He was supposed to be my dad. And then once he left, Patricia and Carla, Patricia became my mom and her daughter became my sister. Eventually, closer as I get closer to the U.S.-Mexico border, Chino becomes her husband, and therefore he becomes my fake dad. And, and these are all um, things, lies, that we used in order to not be deported all the way back to El Salvador. Were you ever asked those questions by border authorities? No? No, it, it, it never came up. Um, I always um, pretended to be asleep when they came up into the buses. And I always froze. I, if they would have asked me, I don't think I would have been able to, to lie to, to authority figures at that time. After your grandfather left you in, in Guadalajara, the very first leg of your journey, and you traveled by so many different means, was by boat, which was an unexpected aspect of your trip. Were you worried uh, about survival on that boat trip? How perilous was it? 
Um, I am from a small coastal town and I didn't know how to swim. I never learned. I was afraid of the water. I was afraid of sharks. I, I was this nature nerd and I knew too much about sharks. And this is before Shark Week on Discovery Channel. I just knew not to trust them. And we were on this 30 foot long boat that has no roof for lack of a better word, it's this motorized skiff. You know, if you, we, you sit down in the boat and if you put your hand out, you can touch ocean water. So it was very scary and it was packed. 30 foot boat, I want to say 30 plus people per boat. There were three boats and the weeks before, again, from the rumor mill and the small coastal Guatemalan town, we heard that three similar boats had capsized and everybody had died, which is why we were supposed to get to town and the next day we were supposed to leave. But it, we also spent another week waiting for new boats and to take this 20 hour boat ride in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I was very afraid. It is colder than you would think in the middle of the ocean. And that was unexpected. But it also ends up being the experience that brings me closer to Chino, this 19 year old young man who I attached to and I began to trust. And he becomes this father figure from that moment on. Father, older brother figure. And he takes care of me, Patricia, and Carla for the rest of, of the trip. Once that journey was finished, you were now in Mexican territory. And one of the uh, first descriptions is you're back on a bus, and an old woman on the bus turns your group in. You run into the Mexican police. And uh, you, you had your first experience with police extortion. What happened? Um, the pecking racial order or racism, internalized racism plays a part in this situation because the woman who turns, in it, turns us in is a indigenous woman. And the cops didn't believe that she was Mexican because she was darker skinned. And in order to prove her Mexicanness, she turns on us because she had heard us talk. And us Salvadorans, we talk, talk differently. And she points at the man, uh, not Patricia, Carla, or me, who always sat together. And she was like, take them. They're not Mexican. And then the questioning begins. They drag the man out. The, our, our new coyote doesn't do anything. So then Patricia freaks out and starts yelling, screaming at the woman. And then the cops come back and they drag Patricia, her daughter, and myself out of the bus. And they point their guns at us. They make us empty our backpacks. They empty our pockets, take our shoes off. And they're looking for money. And as they're doing this, they make us face down on the dirt. And it is one of these experiences that in which I learn how to dissociate, meaning to focus on something that allows me to survive the situation. For me, and it, people ask whether this lizard that I named, and I named Paula, was real, and she was very real. I happened to concentrate on this lizard that is a few feet away from my, my face as I'm face down on the dirt, and I just focus on her, on her tail, on the way that she looked, and instead of focusing on the guns and all the hands that are like tapping all of us looking for money. Did you have any money? I did. Um, we all had money sewed in different parts of our clothing and that money they didn't uh, find, but they found our walk around money, um, if you want to call it that. So I want to fast forward to your first border crossing, which was uh, the Nogales section of, of Mexico and, and uh, Tucson. By this point, you have a, a guide, a coyote named El Mero Mero. Um, and w interestingly, as you set out on this long walk, they distribute white pills to each of you. What was that? I don't know for certain what my friend 
who does a lot of research in the borderlands, what he thinks was there were caffeine pills at best. It could have been uh, coyotes have been known to use meth. Uh, I don't know. Um, and it is the way that they make who they think are the weakest uh, last longer um, in the desert, which also is a double-edged sword because it also makes you dehydrated. And so you have to drink more water. And if you don't make it to the vans and you're on one of these drugs, you're going to die faster. So tell me about that first border crossing. What's the important aspect of that, that section of the journey to know? Uh, you know, moving to Tucson was a very crucial part of me writing this because I remember different snapshots and different parts of the landscape that didn't match up uh, if they all happen in the same sector of the border. And for that first trip, it was hillier, so I can tell you with a 80 to 90% certainty that it was east of Nogales. And we had made it. You know, the route was quick and fast, and we made it to the road in which we were going to get picked up by vans. It, is, it was always a van that was promised to us. And we got there so fast that we were waiting in this crater-like hole on the ground, and instead of the van showing up, immigration showed up and they rounded all of us up. That was the second time that I had a gun pointed at me. Um, Chino gets handcuffed and we get separated from, by, at that point, the group of eight that we had set off from El Salvador with ended up shortening to six. And when we get apprehended, the six uh, shrinks to the four. And it's Patricia, Chino, Carla, and myself. Everybody else that started off with us in El Salvador is gone. And all the other strangers that we banded with in order to make this crossing at the U.S.-Mexico border, I want to say there were like 50 people, all most of them just scatter in the desert. And when that occurs, that is the most dangerous for immigrants because it was very, they don't know the desert. Um, in all likelihood, they did not survive or make it out of the desert, um, and that still haunts me to, the, to, to this day. This was your first ex run in with the U.S. Border Patrol. What was the experience like? Uh, it wasn't pleasant. <laughs> um, I want to say there were five trucks, an agent each. There were also German shepherds that they release the, and they follow people and they're trained to bite if they have to and to bark at the people and to freeze them. So the rest of now the, the agents get there. Um, one of the agents hits Chino and pins him to the ground and handcuffs him. Uh, scenes that a child shouldn't see that no adult should be put to and scenes that still I still carry with me and and then after the violence of the apprehensions we get driven to a detention cell and I spend two nights in this detention cell um, stuck in a small eight by eight room with a toilet and on top of the toilet, it's a faucet that we have to drink water of if we're thirsty. And everybody smells. And there's no room to sleep. Men sleep standing up. Others don't sleep. Um, it's not, they are not the best of conditions. Did they make any accommodation for you or Carla, nine and 11 years old, that you were aware of? No. Um, what they, did was separate the men from the women. Um, and at that time, there were a lot of men immigrating. Um, and they didn't want to separate me from my fake dad, um, which now, at one point, they weren't doing. They were separating the kids from their family members. And so it's, in hindsight, I'm thankful that that practice wasn't in use in 1999. Um, Patricia and Carla had their own cell 
uh, with, I want to say one other woman or two other women uh, that they had caught. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not a good practice and it still haunts me and, and trips me up when I talk about it. Border Patrol returned you to Mexico. Uh, you recovered at the shelter that you described earlier, run by the Catholic nuns. And your original deal with Don Diego was a guaranteed two tries. So the second try was June 2nd. You've been away from home for two months at this point. Uh, long walk through the Sonoran Desert. What was really compelling about this was the helicopters, the running, and the running into cactus for mm -hmm. you and your fellow travelers. What happened? Uh, from my research, this try happened in the Buenos Aires Wildlife Refuge, which is outside, uh, which is west of Nogales, closer to a town named Sasabe, or Sasabe, Arizona. And this was the longest trip. Our coyote, after we run away from a helicopter, we get chased by a helicopter. It turns out that he twists his ankle. And as an adult, I think that it was the running away from the helicopter that disorients him. And so he doesn't know where he is. People can tell that he doesn't know where he's going. He's going slower. We're running out of water. Eventually, by the second night, we he stays. He's like, you guys keep on going. And a lot of the people when we ran away from the helicopter and this happened our first night um bump into cactus and when i mean cactus i'm describe a teddy bear choya which is the worst cactus to run into because they don't have needles that just point forward but they're like hooks and patricia the mom in our group of four runs into one and has so many needles on her face and she's hurting, she gets puffy, she's bleeding. Uh, and then the next day, we spend an entire day walking in the desert, we're out of water. Then the coyote stays the second night. And then the second day in the desert, we're completely out of water. But at this point, we started off with what I call a centipede. I wanna say it was like 50 to 60 people. By the second day in the desert, after the second night, we shrink into 10. Eventually, by mid-afternoon, it is only us four. Everybody else is gone. I don't know where they are. Hopefully, they left us because we were walking slower and they did make it to the vans. I don't know. And in order to survive, we keep on deciding, we meaning Chino and Patricia, the adults, are, again, um, balancing whether it is safe for us to approach a ranch and our directions were like where the vans are there are two vans out front and there are three trees full grown trees and so and it, there's a red brick or red uh, roof I don't remember and so we're trying to decide which of these houses fits the description and none of them do eventually we find one that has a hose and we have we're at this point like 24 hours of that water so we approach the hose and as we're approaching it two dogs come running and the owner of the house comes out with his shotgun and shoots up in the air and tells us not to move and it's broken spanish and that he has already called immigration and then immigration's on its way and that we get stopped again and we have about 15 minutes left, um, and I, I just wanted you to comment, because at this point, your connection with U.S. immigration was Border Patrolman Gonzalez. And mm -hmm. frankly, when I read this part of the story, I was unclear about what his motivations were toward you. What, what, what do you think he was intending with his response to you in your group? You know, I think that he had empathy on us because it was only clearly in his eyes a family who was struggling to make it here and that uh, had already tried i think if we had lied to him and told him that this was our first try he would have taken us back to the detention center and process us 
meaning run our fingerprints. Um, I think he didn't because if he would have done that after the second attempt, the adults with me would have been charged with 10 years in jail. And I don't think he wanted to do that. I've talked to a friend, a close friend of mine who helped me with the research, who used to be a border patrol agent and a writer himself, uh, Francisco Cantu, who is my best friend in Tucson. He's told me that, you know, this is common practice that um, sometimes agents themselves are lazy. They don't want to drive back and do the whole paperwork because you have to fill like almost like a police report. And in the sector that he was, the closest station was like an hour, an hour away. And so my friend thinks that this agent factored that in. He was like, you know what? They're going to try again. And I'm just going to walk them back to across the border, which depending on who you ask, sometimes is better um, that they don't do that, Be especially now in the present day, because if an agent does that, you're putting these immigrants in the hands of the cartels, again, the Mexican cartels, which at that time, the cartels weren't involved as much as they are in the immigrant trade. So in 1999, that was, for lack of a better word, the more empathetic choice to, to make, which is just allow us to walk back into Mexico. So let's spend a minute on the coyotes, because at this point, your contract with the original Don Diego, who ab abandoned you to some of his, his uh, comrades, uh, is over. So for the third try, you have a new set of coyotes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, in 1999, who these people were what, and how their network operated that's different from today? And, you know, I'm not an expert. I'll just say that. Um, Again, this is all hearsay. I can't fully comment on what's going on now. I can only comment on what was going on in 1999. And I was a kid. So at best, this is me as an adult commenting on what I saw as a kid. In hindsight, it seems to me that at that point of time, this was a line of work that everybody did and some people took pride in. They took pride in providing a safe passage for people to come work in this country and to fulfill their dreams of coming to the United States. And some of those people, like any line of work, are better than others and have better routes. And it's the routes that are now have been monetized and appropriated by the cartels. And we happened to sleep the second time that we got deported back to the Mexican side, we happened to sleep in someone's front yard that knew somebody that knew somebody who had a cousin who did these tries, but not in Sasabe. We drove like two hours east, uh, somewhere near in between Naco and Agua Prieta on the Mexican side. And that's uh, where this young man who was, uh, I don't know how long he could have been doing this. He couldn't have been older than 25, 26. And it is his route that ends up working. And it was the fastest route and the safest uh, route. Um, and then we finally make it across one June 10th of 1999. June 10th, and when did you reconnect with your parents? And when along those nine weeks did they finally know you were still alive? Uh, unbeknownst to me, and they only tell me this once I'm reunited with them, one of the members, the original members that leaves El Salvador with Don Dago, uh, he, the first time that we get apprehended by Border Patrol, he runs away beforehand, and he makes it to LA and the moment he gets to LA he calls my parents so this would have been like June 2nd uh, 1999 and he tells them that I am safe that I am with good people and that he's pretty sure that I'm gonna make it and that's the first time that my parents hear from me and the second time that they hear from me is on June 10th 
this, these new coyotes asked me for their phone number, which I had memorized and they call them and he gives my parents instructions of like how much money to bring, where to fly into, if they can come tomorrow to do it by 9 a.m. and to not fly into Tucson, but fly into Phoenix because there might be checkpoints and to take a taxi. Um, and the first exit in Tucson to park at the gas station next to the freeway and that he's going to be there. And he tells them what he's going to be wearing and that's it. And they don't talk to me. Uh, the coyote just gives them details that I'm Javier Zamora from La Herradura and I'm nine years old. And with that bit of information, they take a flight and follow through the directions and are finally reunited with me on 8, 9 a.m. of June 11th, 1999. So clearly, uh, you would not have survived this trip without Patricio and Chino. Uh, they, they really did become your family. And you tell readers at the end that you lost touch with them in the short time after you uh, came to the United States. You hoped that this book would help you reconnect. Is there any news on that front? The book's been out for a little while. You've gotten national publicity. Uh, no, not yet. Um, no, they haven't come out of wherever they are, and I don't expect them to. What would you say I to hope, them if you did, if you saw them again? I wrote, and I wrote this book and I dedicate this book to them. I don't remember ever saying thank you. And this is my way of thanking them for my life. I would not be alive without them. I don't know where I'd be or if I'd be alive. And I just hope my re more realistic scenario would be that they see this book, they open it, and they see that it's dedicated to them. And that not that they read it because they know what happens inside, but they just know that I, this boy has grown up and has never, there hasn't been one day that I have, that I haven't thought about them and that I still carry them with me and their deeds they're completely empathetic deeds full of love um, that I carry with me every single day. We have about five, six minutes left, and this is a subject for another whole hour, but you made it from <laughs> a nine-year-old boy crossing the border to Harvard University and a professional writing life. What was responsible for that journey, that personal journey? Um, it's funny, I talked to my therapist about it today. Um, this boy, once his mom leaves, when I'm five years old, subconsciously learns that one way for him to get love from strangers, including teachers, is to be a good student. And he's going to be such a good student that people are not going to leave. The nuns are going to want him to stay because he wins, he almost wins a national spelling bee. And the same thing happened once I'm back in this country. It's not necessarily that education is gonna get me places, but in a more nuanced way, it is education that's gonna keep people around, that's gonna make people care about me and are gonna make people want to help me which ends up happening. The biggest break of my life is that my coach, my soccer coach uh, in a club, soccer coach, happened to be the athletic director of this very fancy uh, high school, the Branson School in Marin County. Um, and he helps me get into that school because he's, he not only sees that I'm a good athlete, but that I'm a good student. And that becomes a theme then a poet who goes into that classroom sees that I'm a good student and she wants to help me become a writer and also helps me write personal statements that get me into college. Once I'm in college, same thing. And it's like, you can see that that's me being smart, but essentially there's also a read that there is this nine-year-old boy that just wants to be loved and wants to be liked and wants to be helped. 
So throughout my life, I have attempted to recreate the dynamics of the nine year old, uh, of the nine week journey in which it is my charm or intelligence, my lies that makes Patricia, Chino, and Carla want to help me. They didn't have to help me, but they chose to help me. How did you overcome their skill at telling lies? Uh, therapy. <laughs> Uh, lie, lying has gotten me places and it has gotten me in trouble. And that has been the biggest thing that I've had to heal from. And it has affected me. Once you're no longer in survival mode, um, it ends up hurting you. So in our last couple of minutes, I really want to go back to the, the big overall question about Solito. What is the main message you want readers or listeners to take away from it? You know, if I did my job correctly, is that you will now have a face, a name, at least one. It could be mine, it could be Chino's, it could be Patricia's, it could be Carla's. You, as the reader, you now know, personally know, an immigrant. You might already know immigrants, but, but they don't talk about what they've lived through. But now here's one that is sharing this journey with you. And now, hopefully, you have more empathy. You have a friend. You have somebody that you know that survived the desert, that survived the immigrant journey. And I hope that that knowledge turns into action and you as the viewer, as the reader, as the listener now has something more at stake in the immigration discussion. Javier Zamora, your book is Solito. Thank you very much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. No, thank you so much. Q&A programs are available on our website or as a podcast on our C-SPAN Now app.